All right, we have connections now between heat and two quantities, the energy and the enthalpy, and the connections are very simple, and the connection to the energy is very simple when we're doing things at constant volume, and the connection to the enthalpy is particularly simple when we're doing things at constant pressure. So we've done this work partly to get away from this path-dependent quantity of the heat and be able to talk about these state functions, the energy and the enthalpy, instead. Uh, but it's worth pointing out that heat is, despite the fact that it's a path-dependent quantity, a very natural, intuitive, and useful quantity experimentally. Think about when you do a chemical reaction in the lab. Sometimes you can just do that chemical reaction at room temperature, but fairly frequently you want to do that reaction either in an elevated temperature or a lowered temperature. So what you do is perhaps you stick a Bunsen burner under your flask, or perhaps you put your flask in uh, a heat bath that's at... Uh, a hot water heat bath or you put it in an ice bath if you want to lower the temperature. So in every one of those cases what you've done is you've applied some heat. Either you've put heat into the, the reaction vessel or you've removed from some heat from the reaction vessel. What you really want to do is affect the temperature. You want to elevate or reduce the temperature. But the way we control the temperature of something is by the application of heat or the removal of heat from the system. So experimentally we're frequently uh, using heat to control the, the temperature of a reaction. And it's a very common thing to need to know, how much heat do I need to change the temperature by a certain amount? In other words, uh, what's the rate of change of Q with respect to T, or sometimes vice versa? And that quantity is something we define as the heat capacity. So the, the amount of heat per unit change of temperature is, uh, the name's a little bit old fashioned, but we still nonetheless call it a heat capacity. It's the amount of uh, heat's not something that can be held. This, objects don't have a, a capacity for heat in the, in the way that this term implies, but the amount of heat transfer that's required to change the temperature by one degree is called the heat capacity. So you notice this derivative looks a little bit weird. I've had to write a path-dependent dq, an inexact differential dq, above this differential dt in the denominator because heat is a path dependent quantity. So instead it's often more useful to think about state functions like energy and enthalpy. So if we happen to be at constant volume conditions, then the heat is equal to the internal energy then the heat capacity in that specific circumstance would be du dt. And I'll write, I've written this as a partial derivative. And I'll, I'll write that as du dt while holding v constant to remind me that that derivative is taken at constant volume. On the other hand, if I do this at constant pressure, under constant pressure, the heat is equal to the enthalpy. So dq dt becomes dh dt. So the energy and the enthalpy are not the same thing because Q is path dependent. That derivative either looks like du dt or looks like dh dt under different conditions. Again, to remind us of those conditions, I can write the subscript V or the subscript P to remind us that we've, uh, this is the heat capacity at constant volume. This is the heat capacity at constant pressure. So we've got two different definitions of the heat capacity now. And mainly what I've done this for is to get rid of the path dependence. When I define the, the constant volume heat capacity as du dt at constant v, these are all state functions. So this definition is, is always going to be true. This is just a quantity I've uh, defined. It happens to be equal to the, the change in heat with respect to temperature when I'm at uh, constant volume. Likewise, this term is a uh, state function that's not going to depend on the path I take. Uh, it will happen to equal dq dt when I'm at constant pressure. So we've got these expressions. These are both uh, extensive properties. I've written the u and the h without a bar on top. So if I prefer to think about intensive properties, temperature is already intensive. So I can define, if I just divide on either side of this, this equation by the amount of moles of material I have, then I've got the change in the molar energy 
with respect to temperature, and that's equal to the molar constant volume heat capacity, or the intensive equivalent on this side, the constant pressure molar heat capacity. Cp bar is equal to the molar enthalpy, derivative of molar enthalpy with respect to temperature. So those are definitions of constant volume and constant pressure heat capacity, either the extensive or the intensive versions of those. Uh, I suppose since we already know for the specific case of an ideal gas, specifically an ideal gas that, a gas that we can describe well with the 3D particle in a box model. The energy is 3 halves nRT, the enthalpy is 5 halves nRT. We can take the derivatives of those expressions, derivative of energy with respect to T. Uh, in fact, if I want to do this, uh, the molar energy is energy divided by the number of moles, so that's just 3 halves RT. The molar enthalpy would be 5 halves nRT divided by N, so I've got 5 halves RT. If I want to know what is the molar heat capacity of this gas, constant volume heat capacity, I just take the derivative of this expression with respect to T. That's a relatively simple derivative. And I find out that the molar heat capacity is 3 halves R. After taking the derivative, the T goes away. And likewise, the constant pressure heat capacity would be 5 halves R. So again, those these equations on the top here are true for anything. This is just the definition of the heat capacity. These equations, 3 halves R, 5 halves R, are the heat capacities, not of everything, but of an ideal gas, and specifically an ideal gas that behaves like a, a 3D particle in a box. So we have these expressions for the uh, constant pressure and constant volume molar heat capacities. Those allow us to do things relatively easily, like calculate the change in the um, energy or the enthalpy when I change the temperature of something. And to show you how that works, let's see, do that over here. Let's take this expression, du dt at constant v is equal to cv. If I rearrange this expression, actually let's rearrange this one, du dt at constant v is equal to cv. I'll rearrange that question to say du is equal to cv dt. I've just broken up this derivative, left the du on the left, moved the dt over to the right. If I integrate both sides of that expression, du becomes delta u. Uh, let's rewrite cv. Now the, the extensive heat capacity is the number of moles times the intensive heat capacity. If I want to know how much the energy of an object changes, it's moles times its constant volume heat capacity, molar constant volume heat capacity uh, integrated over a change in temperature from some T1 to some T2. In the specific case, so it may be the case that the heat capacity depends on temperature. Anything that depends on temperature, I have to leave inside the integral. If something doesn't depend on temperature, the number of moles certainly doesn't depend on the temperature, so I can pull that out of the integral. If the heat capacity does not depend on temperature, I can pull it out of the integral as well. So I'll note that that is true only if Cv is constant, if it doesn't depend on the temperature. But if I can do that, then this integral is relatively simple. Integral of dt from t1 to t2 is just t evaluated between t1 and t2. So t2 minus t1, that's just the change. Integral of dt is delta t. So we have this expression. Delta u is n times heat capacity times delta t, as long as the heat capacity is, is a constant like 3 halves r or 5 halves r, something that doesn't depend on the temperature. Then internal energy is just moles times molar heat capacity times the change in temperature. If I heat something up, this is how much the energy changes. There's a very similar expression. If I were to do the same thing for enthalpy, we have the expression enthalpy change is N times Cp 
delta t. So those are worth putting in a box because those are expressions we'll use all the time. In both those cases, we have to remember the caveat that the heat capacity, either constant volume or constant pressure, heat capacity has to be constant. But if we can assume the heat capacity is constant, those are relatively easy expressions to use. For example, and this will make it clear why they're useful, if we repeat the same example that we've done uh, two different ways, now using this expression, let's say we have one mole of an ideal gas. that we want to heat from 298 Kelvin to 348 Kelvin. If we do that, let's say we want to know what is the enthalpy change for that process. Delta H is NCP delta T, so all I need to do to calculate the enthalpy change for that process is multiply these three things together, one mole, molar constant pressure heat capacity for an ideal gas, that's 5 halves R. So 5 halves times the gas constant times the change in temperature from 298 Kelvin to, 50, uh, to 348 Kelvin. I've increased the temperature by 50 Kelvin. If I multiply those numbers together, 8.314 times 50 times 2.5, you will perhaps not be surprised to see the answer we get. Works out to be a little over 1,000 joules. Exactly the same answer we got as in the previous example, where we first asked uh, what were the heat and work required to increase the temperature of a mole of an ideal gas by 50 Kelvin. And then later, once we define the enthalpy, what is the enthalpy change for heating a gas the same amount? We've now done the, the, the same thing, but notice the calculation was much simpler. So if all we want to do is calculate the energy or the enthalpy change for an object that's being heated or cooled down, then these expressions are, are often the easiest way to go. Um, notice, I'll make one uh, comment about this point. Notice that I uh, didn't have to even tell you what the pressure and the volume of this gas were. It doesn't matter whether I've done the, uh, heated this gas at a pressure of one atmosphere, as we used in the prior examples, or even if I had a gas compressed to two atmospheres and I heated it from 298 Kelvin to 348 Kelvin, turns out I get the same result. So um, this, this calculation is much simpler. We don't have to know anything other than the amount of the temperature change and how much of the gas we have. Also, I'll point out that this state function, the enthalpy, I didn't have to tell you this was a, a reversible or a constant pressure or a constant volume process. Ordinarily, you might think if I'm calculating an enthalpy, it would only be valid for a constant pressure process. But once I've defined this state function, the enthalpy change when I heat something from 298 Kelvin to 348 Kelvin, a mole of an ideal gas, is going to be 1,040 joules regardless of um, what path I take in getting from state one to state two. So uh, because it's a state function, it does not depend on path. I can calculate the enthalpy change for any path I want and I'll get the same answer. So regardless of what path I actually take, uh, I, can, I can use these expressions to, to calculate the enthalpy change. So those are several convenient features of using this type of expression, thinking about heat capacities when we measure uh, the energy or the enthalpy change of an object <coughs> uh, under a change in temperature.